Hi, this is Brian, and I would like to talk to you guys a little bit about the homework and maybe just work through it a little bit. So make sure first you tried the homework, and then if you're having some trouble, then you tried looking at the hints, and if you're still having some trouble, you tried looking at the answers, or maybe you've done all of this, and then now I'd like to explain how I would solve some of the problems. So this is um, the homework. It's an HTML file. Uh, you can look at it on the internet. It's hosted on GitHub. And we'll teach you in the data products class how to make things like this. Okay. And in fact, I give you a little bit of information about the slides. If you have a correction on the homework, which is always good for me because I make a lot of typos and things like that, uh, remember to submit them as, as GitHub uh, pull request, and then I'll pull them in uh, when I can. So consider influenza epidemics for two parent heterosexual families. Uh, suppose that the probability is 15% that at least one of the parents has contracted disease, 10% that the father has contracted disease, well 9% for the mother. What's the probability that both have contracted the disease? Okay, well let me flip over to my notes and I already wrote some stuff down. So I'm gonna let A be the event that the father contracts the disease, B be the event that the mother contracts the disease, and I've written out, well, that the probability of A we were given was 10% or 0.10. The probability of B was the probability that the mother contracted the disease, and we were given that that was 0.09. And probability A union B, the probability that at least one of the family members have contracted the disease, is 0.15. That's this probability right here. Now we need to get the probability of A intersect B. Okay, so we have a rule that relates these probabilities to the probability of A intersect B. Remember that the probability of A union B, right, that's this, both these circles together, is equal to the probability of A, so we add that guy in once, plus the probability of B, so we add that circle in once, and then minus, we've added this middle part in twice, so we have to subtract it out probability of A intersect B. Well now we can plug in. So we have, oh, that didn't help, there we go. We have 0 0.15 was the probability of A union B. 0 0.10 was the probability for the father. 0 0.09 was the probability of the mother. And probability of A intersect B was the thing that we want, the probability that both contract the disease. Well this was equal to 0 0.19 0.15 minus probability of A intersect B. And then if I subtract my 0.19 from both sides, I get negative um, uh, 0.04. And then if I get rid of my sign on both sides, I get that the probability of A intersect B is 4%. All right, let me go back and check. I'm going to click 4%. And then I'm going to click Submit. Yay! So let's move on to the next one. OK. A random variable x is uniform, which is a uniform is a box from 0 to 1 of height to 1. And it gives the function. But I don't need the function. It's a box. What's the median expressed to two decimal places? All right. So the density looks something like this. Here's 0. Here's 1. There's the density. The height is 1. Now, let me just double check that this is an appropriate density. So the area of a box, the, the density, a density has to have area 1. So the area of a box is the length times the height. In this case, the length is 1, the height is 1. So the area is 1, so it's nice density. Now we need to find the median. Well, what is the median? The median is the point along the x-axis of the density such that 50% of the density lied below it. So if you just draw a different de look at density, something silly like that, the median would be the point, exactly the point x, so that if we move this line a little bit to the right, we'd get more than 50% of the area, and if we move the, r the line a little bit to the left, we'd get less than 50% of the area. So the median, the population, so again, we're talking about density, so this is the population median. So, of course, you know what the sample median is. That's the middle of your data. That's the point such that 50% of your data lies below it and 50% of your data lies above it. But we're talking about inference, so we need to talk about 
population quantities. So this is a conceptually infinite population of data, and this is saying 50% of it lies below it and 50% lies above it. It's pretty easy in this case. We don't have to really do any work, right? We know that the median of the box, the point that would put equal area on either side, would have to be right here in the middle. That would be 0 0.5. So let's check on that. And I want to select, there's my answer. Now there's some rigmarole about it being expressed to, expressed to two decimal places, um, but that doesn't matter so much because it's multiple choice. So let me hit submit and check, yay, okay. And let me show, just, just click on the show answer and it describes a little bit about the calculation. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Okay, moving on to the next one. You are playing a game with a friend where you flip a coin and if it comes up heads, you give her X dollars and if it comes up tails, she gives you Y dollars. Only the coin isn't necessarily a fair coin. The odds that the coin is heads is D. So uh, instead of giving the probability, I give you the odds here. And the question is, what is your expected earnings? Yowza. Okay, let's work through this. So I've written some stuff out here. D is the odds of a head from the coin. Um, you get negative x if it comes up heads, and you get y if it comes up tails. So you lose x dollars if it comes up heads, and you gain y dollars if it comes up tails. So let's let w be your earnings. Okay, so um, w can take the pot potential values, losing x dollars if it comes up heads, and it can take the potential value gaining y dollars if it comes up tails. So the probability of W, the probability that takes these various values would be, let's just label it P for X, and then 1 minus P for tails. So P is the probability of a head for the coin, and 1 minus P is probability of tail. Now the expected value calculation is just the sum. So W is your earnings, what we care about. So your expected earnings is just the sum of your possible earnings times the probability that it takes it. So it would be negative x times p plus y times 1 minus p. Okay, and I think that's probably actually enough to solve the problem, but we need, let's, let's get all the way to the end. So, but unfortunately the problem didn't give us p, the probability of a head, it gave us the odds of a head. So remember that the odds, O, is related to the probability as by being p over 1 minus p. And then there's this one-to-one -one relationship between odds and probability, so we can back solve for probability from knowing the odds. So in that case, p is, oh, and I should just write d for the odds. d is the odds. d equals p over 1 minus p. So if I back solve for the probability, I get d over 1 plus d. And then, if I just calculate what 1 minus p is, that's equal to 1 minus d over 1 plus d, which is equal to 1 plus d over 1 plus d minus d over 1 plus d, which is equal to 1 over 1 plus d. Okay, so let's plug this into there, and this into there, and I get minus x times d over 1 plus d, and plus y times 1 over 1 plus d. Okay, great. And this is kind of a famous problem because if you want the, if, if you want the coin to be fair, then you know, if, if you were given x and y, if you want the coin to be fair, and, or if you want the game to be fair, if you wanted to have expected value 0, you could solve that and figure out what value of d it has to take. Or on the other hand, if you know d, and you want the game to be fair, you can figure out what relationship X and Y have to have, and that's um, related to one of the, the quiz questions. So it looks like this one is the one that I wrote down, minus X times D over 1 plus D plus Y over 1 over 1 plus D. And let's submit, and that's correct. All right, moving on to the next one. A random variable takes the value minus 4 with probability 0.2 and 1 with probability 0.8. What is the variance of this random variable? Ouch. Okay. 
I'm kind of sadistic with these homework problems, but let's let's work on this one. So minus four with probability 0.2 and one with probability 0.8. So minus four with probability 0.2 and one with probability 0.8. So these are the possible values x can take, and these are the probability x takes them. Well, to calculate the variance, what we should do is calculate the expected value of x squared and subtract off the expected value of x quantity squared. Okay, so x squared, that's 16 and 1. Okay, so remember, expected value of a random variable, so expected value of x squared, is the values it can take times the probability that it takes them. So 16 times 0 0.2 plus 1 times 0 0.8. Well, 16 point times 0 0.2 is um, uh, 3.2, and plus 1, 1 times 0 0.8 is 0 0.8, so expected value of x squared is 4. And then expected value of x is equal to the possible values x can take times the probability that it takes it. So minus 4 times 0 0.2 plus 1 times 0.8. Well, that's equal to minus 0.8 plus 0.8. Oh good, it's 0. So if I plug into my formula up here, I get 4 for that minus 0 squared, which is 4. Okay, let's try it. 4 Submit. All right. Okay, let's do the next one. If x bar and y bar are sample means comprised of n iid random variables arising from distributions having means mu x and mu y, respectively, and a common variance of sigma squared, what's the variance of x bar minus y bar? Okay, this seems like a very confusing problem, but let's talk our way through it because it's a quite important problem. So. Let's orient ourselves because this is important for us to think about. If I have a density that has mean mu x and it has variance, the sort of spread of it is governed by sigma squared, that's a population distribution. That's assuming that if I draw data at, from this population that their probabilities, the probability they take various values will be governed by this general law, this, this general density distribution that is sort of a conceptual component of a population. Maybe if we were to collect an infinite amount of data, we would know this density exactly. If I were to draw n observations from this density and take their mean, I get another random variable, and that's a single draw from another density, one that's the density of the average of n draws from this existing density. And we know a lot of things about that density. For example, that it is centered at the same place, but it's shrunken in, it's compressed around mu x a little bit more, and that's just saying that x bar is a good estimator of mu. It's a better estimator of mu than just a random observation from the original population. The average of n observations from the original population is a better estimator because the density governing the probabilities associated with x bar is more shrunken around the thing that you're trying to estimate. And in fact, we know how to relate the variance of this density, the density of the x bar, to the variance of the population. The variance of the original population is sigma squared, then the variance of x bar is equal to sigma squared over n. So the result of collecting n observations and taking a mean is to get a new random variable, the sample mean, whose whose variance is now shrunken by a factor of n, which is a good thing, right? And it's also centered around what you want, the density is centered around what you'd like to estimate. And similarly, the variance of y bar is going to be sigma squared over n, because we assume that the, the population that the y's were drawn from had the same variance as the population that the x's were drawn from. Okay, so now let's talk about the variance of x bar minus y bar. Well, if so we said that the, the, the data were independent, that the x's were independent of the y's, which is good. 
um, because that means that our variance adds. And so we could write variance of x bar and then variance of y bar. And you, you'd be inclined to put a minus sign here, but that would not be right. And it's a plus sign. And the reason is because this. Think about it this way. If I were to do variance of x bar plus negative y bar, and my x bar and y bar are independent, then that would be the variance of x bar plus the variance of negative y bar. And then if I were to pull out my negative 1, it gets squared, right? Remember that rule, if we pull something out of a variance, it gets squared. And then the square of a negative 1 would be positive. And so at any rate, the long and short is if you subtract two things, their variance still adds. Now, if the two things aren't independent, then we may have other stuff over here that we have to add in. Subtract off, in fact, in this case. But these things are independent, so there is no covariance term or other thing we have to subtract off. Okay, so let's plug in. We have sigma squared over n for x bar, sigma squared over n for y bar for the variance of y bar. And they add, so it's equal to 2 sigma squared over n. And so let's go back and try that as an answer. 2 sigma squared over n. Submit answer. All right. OK, only a couple left. Let x, bar, let x be a random variable having standard deviation sigma. What can be said about x over sigma? And so we have some things to rule out. Well, nothing. It must have variance 1. It must have mean 0. It must have variance 0. Let's try some things. So here we have what, what we're given is that variance of x is equal to sigma squared, so that the standard deviation of a random variable x is sigma. So let's think about x over x over sigma. It's expected value. Remember, we can factor things out of expected values. That's expected value of x over sigma. And we don't know anything about what expected value of x is. And we don't know anything about sigma other than it's strictly positive. So we can't say anything about the mean of x. It could be anything. OK, now what about the variance? of x over sigma. Well, remember when we pull a factor out of a variance, it gets squared. So that's 1 over sigma squared times the variance of x. Oh, but we wrote that down over there. That's sigma squared. So it's sigma squared over sigma squared, which is 1. Well, that was one of the answers, that it has to have variance 1. So let's try that. Must have variance 1. Submit. There you go. All right, let's keep going on. Second to last, penultimate problem. If a continuous density that never touches the horizontal axis is symmetric about 0, can we say its associated meaning is 0? Um, so this is, this is a little bit of an unfair problem. And if you didn't get this, certainly don't feel badly about it. And I'll tell you why. So, what the, so here we have a density. And here I've said it never touches 0. And it's symmetric about the vertical axis. So what, me, what that means is if I draw it like that, then it has to look like that on the other side. If I were to draw it, if I were to draw something like this, let me see if now if I can, it's got to look like that on the other side. And so to me, it looks pretty clear that this density has to have median zero because the amount of area that's on this side has to be the same as the amount of area on this side because it's flipped over, it's, it's symmetric. Now the reason about the sort of rigmarole and the problem about never touching zero, and, and that's what makes it confusing. I think that's why it was a little bit of an unfair problem. I, I had it in the actual quizzes at one point, and um, it caused a lot of problems. So now I put it in the homework, so at least we can discuss it. And some of the students, when I put it in the homework, I had it without this caveat that the density had to be touching zero. And students came up with this example, which is really clever, of course. Imagine a density that looks something like this. OK. Now, here it's, it's, it's strictly 0 right here. Here's 0. Now remember, what's the median of a density? The median is that point such that 50% lies below it and 50% lies above it. Well, this, I didn't draw it perfectly, but I'm, I'm trying to suggest that this and this are mirror images of each other around this vertical axis. But it's 0 in between. So any point along between here, any point between where the densities start rising above zero again, any point 
would be such that 50%, because right, 50% lies there and 50% lies there. So any point in here would be a median. And they all said, well, how do you define the median in that case? Is it necessarily zero? Is it the midpoint of all the potential medians in, the, in there? Or is it the leftmost median? Or is it the rightmost median? And that was kind of confusing. But I also thought it was an incredibly clever point made by many of the students in the class. So I thought I'd raise it up and give it as one of the, um, give it as one of the homework questions so at least we could discuss it. So I'm going to put yes here and submit. And then I just want to show you the answer because I actually go through some of this discussion and I actually put in that this is a surprisingly hard problem. It seems uh, my intention was for it to be an easy problem. My original intention was yes, if a density is symmetric about zero, then its median is zero because 50% lies below zero and 50% lies above zero. But there's this caveat that if it's flat on the horizontal axis right around zero, then well, that causes, that causes problem. So I described this caveat a little bit in the homework um, in the homework problem. And if you miss this little kind of subtle point of nuance, I mean, this is really not an, a major important point. What I'm hoping you'll know is what a median is. Basically, what is what does it mean for a point to be the a population median? And it's just that point such that 50% of the density lies below it and 50% lies above it. All right, final problem, and thank goodness it involves some computing. So I'm giving you a, a probability mass function, but one that's just defined. x takes the values 2 through 5, and the probability that x takes these values is 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and it says what's the variance. So x takes the values 2 to 5, and p, the probability it takes them, is, if I recall, it was 1 to 4 divided by 10. Let's double check. There's p, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4. And let's just double check. The possible values, the probabilities have to sum up to 1. So there, and then if I, there's x. 2, 3, 4, 5, and the probability that it takes it, 1.1, 1, 0.2, 0.3, 0.4. 1, well, what's the variance? It's expected value of x squared minus expected value of x quantity squared. So expected value of x squared is sum x squared, the, the x squared values times the probability that it takes them, times p. Expected value of x is sum x times p, the possible values x takes times the probability that it takes them, raised to the second power because I want expected value of x quantity squared. That works out to be 1. Okay, so hopefully 1 is a potential answer. I see right here that 1 is a potential answer. So I'm going to do it and submit. There we go. So I just want to end with a couple comments on the homework. It, you know, obviously it looks like I'm going through it kind of fast if you um, are struggling with it. And remember, I wrote the actual homework problem, so of course I can go through it fast. Uh, this is kind of complicated stuff, but it's also important stuff. And so keep plugging away. I think the, I made the homework a little bit harder than the quizzes so that um, you know maybe it'll pump up your muscles for when you go take the quizzes it'll be it'll be easy I remember when I used to do swim practice we used to swim with all this stuff dragging on us so that when we tried to race it seemed like we we're a lot lighter it didn't work for me but nonetheless maybe it'll work for you alright so keep plugging away at that homework and uh, I'll post a video about the second homework set um, similarly working through the problems